So yeah, I wanted to thank Adolphus for joining us in our time zone. He's actually in Central Europe time, so it's quite early in the morning for him. So thank you very much for uh, getting up early to give us a talk. I have followed Alecos uh, for the past, I don't know, months, and he's been doing a lot of interesting projects, in particular um, the project that he started now, which is Magical Bitcoin. Um, he has a, a good technical background and worked also with some, done some, uh, some PRs on the Elements Project and on the LNP BP Standards Library. So I'll let him describe what the Magical Bitcoin Project is. He's going to give us a little demo. And uh, again, just thanks for joining us. And I'll hand it off to Alakos. I'm Alakos Filini. Um, I am a developer. I work on Bitcoin. Uh, I, I came to Bitcoin pretty late compared to um, well, many of the people I, I work with. So I started like uh, a couple of years ago. Um, working with Giacomo Zucco um, at BHB Network, that was uh, his startup. Um, uh, then I, I worked for a while at Blockstream, and then I left to um, kind of, I didn't really have a specific thing in mind when I left, and then Magical became the a big thing I'm working on uh, after after Blockstream. So this is um, my, my new project. I've been working on that for, for the past um, few months. Um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, I, I don't like to make um, like very theoretical presentations. I like to make a practical presentation where I actually like show how, how things work. So I'm going to have like a little bit of a, um, yeah, a, like introduction, uh, a few slides to kind of introduce a few concepts and, and then we can move to um, the like the online playground uh, that, that I made for, for this thing. And I'm going to show like a more hands-on approach on, on that. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the goals, uh, pretty much, of Magical Bitcoin. Um, the main goal is to like develop a set of tools and libraries for on-chain wallets. So the idea is that well, there, there are already um, tools and libraries to make wallets today, uh, like uh, Python, uh, Bitcoin Lib, or Rust Bitcoin, or whatever. Um, the point is that these libraries are more like the low-level libraries, so you still need a lot of um, other like layers on top of it, so, so it's not something that a non-developer, oh sorry, a non-Bitcoiner, a non-Bitcoin developer can take and use to make a wallet. Uh, and also more importantly, more than like wallet, um, it's integration into like other projects that people might have. So you want to integrate Bitcoin into your project and, and uh, these tools are like very, very low level and, and it's hard to use them. So you maybe end up using like a centralized server with some APIs and, and that's bad. So uh, the first thing is I want to develop something that is uh, fairly easy to use um, uh, and also a way to like concentrate the development effort of multiple people. So instead of having uh, many people rebuilding the same things over and over. So um, basically now the, the part that is actually shared is just this very low level layer and then people are repeating the same things like, I don't know, the coin selection logic or transaction signing logic or whatever. These are like the uh, written and, and rewritten multiple times over and over multiple projects. And I think this is kind of a, a waste in a way of resources. It would be better to just uh, make it in, in one uh, repository, make it very well peer reviewed, very, very modular, very uh, extensible. Uh, and then we can all work on that one thing and everybody can use it. And, and it's probably going to be better than every single little implementation made by a uh, single like, developer. So, uh, this is the goal, and generalize is probably the, uh, well, the, these three things, generalize, modular, and extensible, these are uh, all three pretty important. I would say generalize is probably the biggest one, because if you want to wait, make one library for everybody, you have to make it generalized, because you can, um, like if I make a single C wallet library, uh, that would work, but only for people who are interested in, in single C wallets. And, and that's not everybody, but if you can make it more generalized, like you also support multi sigs you also support uh, other um, scripting um, primitives, uh, then it can really become the uh, one library for everybody. And the well, super very ambitious <laughs> long-term goal would be to kind of become the, uh, what I would say, de facto standard platform to build walls or, um, yeah, not only to build like native wallets, but also to integrate wallets into other projects. So like today, if you wanna install a Bitcoin uh, full node, you go with Bitcoin Core. You don't even like question that because you have everything you need in there. 
uh, that can be kind of the goal, very, very ambitious goal of magic. So you need to make a, some kind of wallet, you need to integrate the wallet in your product and you just go with that because that, that's where everybody's working, where where everything is concentrated. So uh, yeah, I know it's very ambitious, kind of sounds crazy to say that, but um, that's kind of like the, the, the end long-term goal for, for this project. Um, and I think while, uh, while I was like thinking about how to do that, uh, I also realized that there's uh, today like an adoption gap, or maybe I should say more like um, an adoption lag. So there are like a lot of many power, uh, a lot of powerful um, scripting primitives that are pretty much unused today. So think about time locks. Um, so uh, both relative and, and uh, absolute time locks. So they, they exist in Bitcoin. They've been there for a while now, uh, but there aren't really that many uh, wallets that support these. So there are like very few specific cases of wallet that supports them, but they support them in a very specific way. So uh, I think maybe maybe about uh, Lightning. Lightning uses these time locks, but uh, it doesn't really support uh, generalized scripting. It only supports the few scripts uh, that you need for Lightning, and that would make sense for Lightning. But the point is, uh, from the perspective, of, from the developer's perspective, uh, there was somebody who uh, wrote code to support like these uh, three specific cases, and that's it. And if I want to make a fourth case, maybe my project, I can't really. So yeah, basically the thing is there aren't really like generalized tools to uh, use these uh, powerful primitives uh, and tools that exist today use them in a very, very specific way that it's not useful uh, outside of these specific tools. Uh, and even Bitcoin Core kind of struggles with them. So it can obviously validate them, um, but it can't really, uh, there, there are no like options to generate a transaction uh, with a, a time lock in the script. Um, and, and there's a good reason, obviously, for that, because writing script manually is very, very hard. So only a few, uh, I would say, very expert developers can do that. It's not something that a new developer can come. Um, and again, uh, the, the example I was making before, so you're making a product, you're trying to integrate Bitcoin to your product. I don't have like time, and it will also probably be very dangerous to start writing very uh, complex scripts. So what usually ends up is that, that nobody uh, uses them. Uh, so while the main goal of Magical is just to provide something that is generalized um, as a kind of a side effect, it is also uh, filling this gap because when, when you try to make something generalized, you also have to, uh, if you want to support as many like cases as possible, you also need to start supporting these. Uh, so it's not only just a new wallet library, like many that already exist, it's also kind of pushing the boundaries of what has being done in a wallet library in this sense of um, maybe like specifically with time locks um, that are pretty much being in use today. Uh, so it's it not only just in yet another wallet library, it's also kind of trying to add something new to it. Um, and in order to do that, uh, you need hey, to- Hey, Lekos, um, I have a question. Like, yeah. Is that similar to Simplicity? You know, Simplicity is gonna be used to help Write smart contracts and stuff. Is that the same thing that your software is hoping to achieve? Not really. So Simplicity is like a new scripting language and, and everything. Uh, this is uh, this uses uh, the like Bitcoin scripting that we have today. So it's nothing new, nothing like uh, no soft ports or, or anything to enable that. It's like literally the, the current Bitcoin uh, scripting system that I believe is very. Uh, it's much more, more more powerful than people think because there are a lot of hidden like gems that nobody is using. So this could potentially support uh, simplicity when, it, uh, when it's added to Bitcoin. Uh, but the, the thing is, uh, maybe more than simplicity, I'm like excited by Taproot because Taproot is also one thing that you could add to that uh, when, it's, um, when it's added to Bitcoin. So the, the goal is support, uh, since it's modular generalized, pretty much everything that works on Bitcoin. So, you can have the simplicity module if you want, you can have the taproot module, or you can just use the normal scripting. Uh, and that's like a, not a new scripting language, it's uh, what already exists in Bitcoin today. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna move forward and we can, we can have questions uh, also later at the end. Um, so I, I was saying in order to do that, you need a few, um, you need to kind of reinvent a few things that we take for granted in wallets. Uh, one of them is, 
basically a way to describe a wallet because today we use like a bit of an ammonic and, and, and that's it. That's enough to describe a single seed wallet because uh, you're describing basically just one key. Uh, but if it's a single seed wallet, you always know how to take that key and, and turn it into a Bitcoin script and turn it into an address and then watch your addresses and then see your balance and, and everything. So uh, that works for a single seed wallet. But if you want to move into more generalized wallets where you have maybe multiple keys, uh, you need something a bit more uh, that, that basically lets you express this, not only just uh, a way to encode the single keys, but also encode the structure of a script. Uh, and those are the scripts that I'm going to go uh, into the details in a second. And the other very important primitive is uh, PSBT. It's probably much more uh, popular. Uh, but basically, the idea is that if you go into generalized scripts, uh, it's very likely that there are going to be multiple keys into the scripts because Otherwise, uh, just a single seed with maybe time block or something. Um, and, and when you start having uh, multiple keys, you also have multiple parties that need to sign the transaction. So uh, PSBT becomes very, very useful. Um, and a little bit in, in details of uh, these two primitives. Uh, descriptors and, and mean scripts have a pretty uh, a close relationship <laughs> with each other. Um, descriptors are basically a way of uh, formally describing how to construct a script. Uh, so in my mind, I kind of see them as a one-to-one -one representation uh, between, a, uh, well, not really one-to-one, -one, like a one-to-many representation. So you have one descriptor, and from that descriptor, you can gener generate uh, multiple single uh, scripts by basically deriving every single key. So in your descriptor, you have like uh, XPubs uh, that are extended keys. And from these XPubs, you can generate multiple single uh, individual public keys. So you can take this as descriptor and gener generate uh, every single address that makes up um, a wallet. And this is a uh, more or less like standardized language. So it's supported partially in um, Bitcoin Core, uh, but the main, like the, the full implementation uh, has been made with uh, specifically with Miniscript. Um, and yeah, the descriptor and code. Uh, basically everything about your script. So the encoded script type can be a, a pay to script hash or maybe a pay to witness script hash or a nested script hash. Um, it, it encodes the structure, so the, the elements that make up the script, every single key, every single derivation path. So you, you, you have pretty much everything you need. You just take the script and you have your full wallet. Uh, and it's, um, as I was saying before, normally not really written by end. It, it can be done, obviously, but it's normally um, used uh, with Miniscript, with a Miniscript compiler. Um, and this, uh, I think there are a lot of like misconceptions around that because there are two separate languages. Uh, one is the Miniscript language and one is the descriptor language. And they can look pretty similar, so people uh, normally mistake them uh, from one another. Um, uh, but the, the point is that Miniscript is even more like high level. So you have the Miniscript language that lets you express a policy like in, in an abstract way. So you basically can say, I want these two public keys. Uh, these two public keys need to sign in order to spend the funds. And that's all you say at the mean script level. Then mean script uh, turns this into a descriptor. And while doing that, it also tries to um, make it as cheap, as cheap as possible to spend from that script later on. So you can also say, um, maybe I have two keys. Uh, I can, either of them can spend the funds, but I'm more likely to use uh, one of the two keys for, I don't know, whatever reason. Maybe the other one is just the backup key. So I normally use this key instead of the other one. I mean, script takes that into account to produce a descriptor uh, that has like a structure that is going to be uh, the cheaper to spend from uh, later on, uh, like in terms of fees, in terms of transaction size. Uh, so there are like three layers. You have at the bottom the Bitcoin scripting. Uh, on top of it, you have descriptors, and then on top of it, you have a mini script. Um, and well, PSBT is, uh, people are probably very familiar with that because it's uh, kind of starting to be used uh, everywhere. But it's basically a way to uh, like a standardized encoding of a transaction, uh, of partial signatures of that transaction, uh, and also like metadata about key derivation, about the inputs, about change outputs, etc. So the point is, if you're making like an air gap wallet or something like that, um, you need a lot of this metadata to come from the from who created the transaction. So you, you can look at the blockchain yourself. So PSBT are very useful for that because they're like self-contained. So if you need to sign a transaction, 
a PSBT contains basically everything you need uh, to do that. You know how to derive your keys. You know uh, which inputs are being spent. You know uh, how much uh, is your change uh, and everything. So uh, it's very useful to uh, have this thing go around multiple people and everybody can add like can obviously inspect the PSBT and then add um, their signatures to that. Um, and, and then you can like aggregate all the partial signatures into the um, well, not really aggregated, that's probably not the right term, but you can take every single um, partial signature and, and build the full um, script seek or, or the full uh, witness and, and actually spend, uh, spend and book the, the funds. Um, so these are the two, um, I would say, main, um, main primitives that, that, that make up Magical. So Magical is basically built on, on uh, this and on using this. Um, and, and there's this uh, magical Bitcoin wallet, which is the main repository of the project. So if you go main repository uh, of the project, so if you go on GitHub, uh, you're basically going to see that uh, plus a few other little things. Uh, this is like a fully working uh, wallet library. So you can take that uh, and integrate it into it's, it's written in Rust. So uh, not like a very popular language, but very uh, cool for like some security properties. Uh, it has, in my opinion. So you can, if you have a Rust project, you can take that, integrate it into your project in like three or four lines, and you can do basically everything that a normal wallet does. So like you can generate addresses, you can monitor the blockchain, you can create a transaction, sign a transaction. And the idea is that, as I was saying before, this is very modular. So for instance, you have the choice. You can say, I want to use Electrum to monitor the blockchain, or maybe use Explora. Uh, these are the two methods. Uh, Explora is the block explorer, uh, block single info. Uh, these are the two like main methods for today, but it can be very very easily extended. So in the future, you could have also the uh, full node option where you connect directly to your full node, or maybe compact block filters uh, and, and everything. Um, and, and there's also a very minimalistic command line. So this is mostly meant to be, um, as I was saying before, like something that you integrate into other projects. So this is not like by itself the product. It, it, there's no uh, or maybe in the future there's going to be one, but not today. There's no the magical Bitcoin wallet itself, uh, but you can also use it more like as a developer tool from a command line. So this is kind of a full wallet uh, that you can install and use, but not very user friendly because this is most, mostly like targeted to developers uh, that are going to actually integrate that um, into their own projects. So yeah, uh, and this thing can also be compiled to run in a browser. Uh, so the point is that Rust is uh, then compiled to like native languages. So uh, the library itself is in Rust, but it's, it wouldn't be super hard to use it even in other languages, uh, like in Python or whatever. Uh, and it can also be compiled to WebAssembly and, and then trying the browser. So this is what I'm going to be showing you. Um, there is like a the full command line is probably a little bit more powerful than what runs in a browser. Uh, but what runs in a browser has a nicer UI, so that, that's kind of um, easier to follow and understand. So uh, I'm going to basically move uh, to the demo state. Uh, um, so yeah, something is probably going to go wrong. I'm just going to say that now. Because <laughs> this is like very, very early stage uh, development of, of things. Uh, but if you go um, to magicalbitcoin.org, this is the main website for the project. Uh, <laughs> Um, where there's the pretty much all the documentation uh, is being written. Um, on this website, there's this playground section, uh, which is basically uh, that thing, uh, that magical between wallet repo compiled to run in a browser uh, with like a, a, a little mm -hmm. nice uh, UI on top of it. So the first thing we have uh, up here is the policy compiler. So this is the mini script. Uh, thing I was talking about. Um, this is like a one-time thing. So when you want to make a new wallet, you have to write a policy for this wallet uh, and basically like extract, like generate the scriptor for that wallet. And then from that point on, you're not going to use the compiler anymore. It's just a one-time thing where you generate the, the wallet and then you just keep reusing uh, the same the scriptor, obviously. Um, so just going to start uh, with the fairly simple example, like a uh, one of two multi-sig. So we can, uh, there are a few examples here, or if you go in here in, in the script section, there are like the 
native uh, individual blocks that you can use, but I'm just going to use the examples that are pre-built. Yeah, it's easier to use them. Um, so for instance, we can take this uh, block, this example, and this is, hopefully uh, you can see that. Uh, I've zoomed in uh, quite a lot. Um, this is an or block. So basically what I'm saying is um, my script condition uh, uh, needs to be like the, the spending policy that needs to be satisfied to move funds sent to uh, this wallet uh, is an or between these two items. And these items could be not only keys, but even other, like uh, maybe time block or, or something like that. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to keep it simple. This is, there are two possible keys, two possible items, and, and you need to satisfy at least one of them um, in order to spend from, uh, from this wallet. Um, so this is the same thing in like written form. So this is the mini script language. So you have or pk Alice, pk Bob, which means or uh, either Alice or Bob should sign uh, with their uh, public key in order to spend from this wallet. Uh, you can choose the type. Maybe I don't know. We can go with a uh, native um, segwit um, page script dash, uh, and then uh, the key generation. What I would normally do uh, is now it's not integrated into this yet. Uh, so normally I use this other website, which is called, uh, which is beef32.org, to just generate keys quickly. Uh, obviously, like in the future, uh, it's going to be integrated uh, into the same um, into the same uh, page, basically. Uh, so I'm just going to generate like a random key just uh, that I can use. Um, so this is yeah. So this is like a random key that has been generated. I'm going to take the public version of that to kind of simulate a two-party descriptor when um, every single party only has one of the two private keys. Um, so I'm going to take, which is, should be done here. Yes. So this is the public version of this key. Uh, and I'm going to say um, Alice as uh, this key. And I'm also going to provide their version path, just very simple uh, incremental index at the end. Um, and then instead for Bob, I'm going to generate a, an extended key. So this means that we're also going to have the private part. So in this descriptor, we're going to have one public key, which is Alice's key. Um, and then for Bob, we're going to have, uh, it's going to generate it inside, and it's going to also have the private uh, part. So this basically means take this uh, script and replace every instance of the uh, Alice public key with this key and every instance of the Bob key. Uh, with the key you generate, and that is also going to uh, uh, return me later. Uh, when I hit compile, uh, this is what I get. Uh, this is basically a descriptor. Uh, well, this is a descriptor, uh, and you can see the different codes, um, the type of script. This is a witness script dash uh, script. Um, the condition is an OR between uh, this item and this other, uh, sorry, this other uh, item. Uh, you can see that for this one, we only have the public key. So this is a, just, a, a, I can generate every individual key, but I can uh, generate signatures for, for this one. Or instead for this one, I can, because this is a private uh, uh, extended key. So I also have the private part of that. So this is my descriptor. Uh, if I was doing that with somebody else, uh, maybe let's say that Alice is Bob. Uh, I am Bob. I generated my own key and Alice provided um, uh, her uh, public key, and I uh, put this together into this descriptor. And now this is the descriptor that describes my wallet. This is from my side, and obviously from her side will be the opposite. So uh, she has the private key for her signatures, and I and she has the public uh, key for for my for my um, yeah like my my block my item. So now I can take this descriptor um, and oops, plug it in. Uh, down here in the wallet section. So I'm actually going to close this to compile it. Uh, so now this is the real uh, like wallet thing. So once you have a descriptor, you can actually use it to uh, build a, a full wallet. Uh, so you plug the descriptor in. You can optionally also have a different descriptor for change addresses. So for instance, when you create a transaction uh, and you have to generate a change, instead of generating a new address from this descriptor, you can generate it from this other one. Um, for instance, like Bitcoin Core does that normally, but here, just to make it simpler, I'm not going to use that. So you hit start. Uh, basically, what happens in the ground is that it creates a wallet and also runs the sync command. Uh, and this basically means 
uh, synchronized with the blockchain with the whatever method you choose. In this case, from the browser, Electrum uh, doesn't work. So the only method you have from a browser is Explorer. Uh, so in the background, it was connected to blockstream.info, to the, the API of blockstream.info, and just like trying to see what unspent outputs they have, uh, what's my balance, and, and this kind of stuff. So it should be empty initially, obviously, because I just generated it. So get balance, zero splashy. Um, I can now like generate a new address for um, uh, for, for, for this wallet, and it's the get new address command. Uh, so this generates the first address from this descriptor. I, I can generate multiple addresses, and they are different because every address uh, increments the um, index here at the end of the keys. So uh, basically, every time that I generate a new address, you are incrementing the uh, B32 derivation um, for, for, for every key. Um, now I'm going to deposit some funds. This is on testnet, obviously. So uh, I have a testnet wallet on my phone. I can just put uh, some satoshis with that. So you're also going to be able to see that later on on the blockchain. So that this happens uh, on the testnet blockchain, obviously. Uh, so you can see all of that uh, later. OK, so I've sent the transaction from here. So I'm going to wait a second for propagation. Um, and then I can run the sync command again. Maybe this time I'm also going to open the browser console so just you can see what happens in background. So this is the network tab, so you can see every network request that is being made uh, in background. And you can see when I run the sync command, it starts making requests to uh, blockstream.info. So unfortunately, there are no like batched uh, APIs from blockstream.info, so you have to uh, individual query uh, for every single address. Uh, you can also see this row request. This is a row transaction that it downloaded. So presumably it's the one transaction I, I just sent. Um, and now it looks like it's done. It, it looks for like a, um, a gap between the, so, so when it sees, I, I think 20 uh, consecutive addresses that are not being used, it obviously can change that by default it's 20. It's gonna stop syncing. So in this case, I just sent uh, something to the first address, so uh, it went to like the 21st address, and, and after that it stopped uh, syncing. And if I run the get balance command, I can see that I have um, the stoshes um, in, in my balance. I think it's also interesting to note here that you're, you compiled your code into this into JavaScript from Wasm. It's entirely running in the browser. You're not hitting the server, right? It's all running in the browser yeah. sandbox, basically. Which is interesting. Yeah, this, that be quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, the only thing that I'm uh, I, I'm connecting to a server just to monitor the blockchain, so I'm connecting blockstream the info just to get information about the blockchain. But obviously, I could. Uh, it's all running in my browser. Yeah, so. right. So the, the wallet itself, all of these uh, functionalities, like generating your address, this is all happening um, in the browser itself. And also, it's written in Rust, which is, I believe, a very important point. So it's not written in JavaScript, but it's written in Rust compiled to JavaScript. Uh, and I believe Rust as a language is much more, much like safer to use for many of its properties than JavaScript. I would feel much more confident using uh, a wallet made in Rust and compiled to uh, work in a browser than a wallet made natively in, in uh, like JavaScript. Um, so once we are here, I'm just going to show uh, a few other comments. Um, there's one very interesting command, which is the policy command, policies, sorry. Um, this this is kind of complicated to see um, right, right here. So maybe I'm gonna open like a uh, JSON viewer or something online. Uh, basically, this command uh, tells you uh, it's kind of an interpreter for for the descriptor. If that makes sense. So it tells you the conditions encoded by the descriptor in a more like uh, well, not really human readable, but in a way that can be turned into a graphical thing very easily. So. If we run this command on our descriptor, we can see that at the top level, at the root level, uh, we have a threshold. So we have a few like items that are general, generalized. They could be very complex conditions. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's just a few items. Uh, and we need to satisfy at least one of these. So the threshold is one in order to be able to spend. And the items in this case are uh, the two signatures. So item zero is signatures made from this key. Item one is signatures made from that other key. 
uh, and, and we see that if we can satisfy at least one of these, uh, we can actually uh, spend from, from this script. And for every single item, we also get, you can kind of ignore the satisfaction thing because it's not implemented yet. But the contribution uh, like field uh, tells us uh, how can we contribute to every single item. So in this case, uh, the contribution to this signature is none because this is Alice, uh, Alice's signature and this is seen from the uh, from Bob's perspective, basically. So I, I don't have the key uh, for, for this signature. I can't really contribute to that. I can't make a signature for that. Uh, but I can complete, which means basically I can fully uh, satisfy this other block because this is my own uh, key. So contribution for that is none, contribution for that is complete. And when you combine these, uh, into the root level, so that was this. Um, the, the, at the root level, this is the important thing. So this basically tells you, can you actually spend by yourself uh, from this script? Uh, and in this case, yes, because this is a partial complete, which basically means we can partially satisfy uh, that, but that's enough to complete it. So uh, there are two items, we can satisfy one, and it's also gonna tell us like, which item can you satisfy item number one, because that's our signatures, which is right here. So basically, what's, what what this thing is, thing is, is uh, telling us is uh, your, you yourself, uh, by yourself, with your signatures, you can actually satisfy and, and fully spend uh, from this script. So I think I'm kind of running late, so I'm just going to show how to spend, and, and then uh, I'm going to move to questions. Um, so I can like generate a new address. I'm just going to send uh, funds to this new address. Uh, then there's the create TX command, which is uh, create TX uh, dash dash two, and you say to which address you want to send funds. Uh, and the syntax here is like address uh, colon uh, amani satoshis. Uh, there's also like a shortcut, which is you can say zero and then say send all, which basically means uh, send everything minus the fees to, to that address. Uh, so I'm gonna run that, and this uh, gives me a PSBT. Um, I can't really show <laughs> the content of the PSBT now, so I'm just gonna move uh, to the next step, which is signing. Uh, so this, for instance, could happen on an air gap, uh, on sorry, on a watch-only computer. So uh, there's the yeah, I'm just gonna show that very quickly. There's another command, which is the public descriptor command, which basically returns uh, oops, sorry the public version of the descriptor where every key is public. So I could, for instance, um, take this public descriptor and, and place that on a computer which is connected to the internet and, and online. I can create a transaction from that computer because that one saw uh, all the uh, outputs that I can spend, that I can spend, and then I can move this PSBT to an aircraft computer where I actually have the keys, but they, they are on an aircraft computer, so it's uh, safer and I can sign the PSBT like that. Um, and we get back basically another PSBT. This is a bit bigger than the one before because this also is this also contains the signatures, so this is uh, bigger for, for that reason. And we also get the row transaction because in this case, there are enough signatures in this uh, PSBT to actually uh, finalize and extract the final uh, row transaction. Um, in this case, this is a bit of an older version of Magical, so this has changed in, in the uh, GitHub repo, but it's not published here yet. So you still need to uh, broadcast the PMT. So with the new version, you can also broadcast that, which makes uh, more sense. Um, but here I have to actually broadcast the PSBT, which basically means uh, rerun this finalization phase and, and then broadcast. So I can say broadcast dash dash PSBT. Uh, and this is the TX ID. So I can actually look that up uh, on the block explorer, um, on the testnet block explorer, let's see. And this is the transa transaction we just made. Um, if you look at the witness, you can see uh, this is our script. So this is like the first public key and the second public key. Uh, and you can see that we uh, made one signature. And this, this looks like a signature because it starts with that 3044. That that's, uh, normally happens with signatures. Um, then there's like a dummy push, which is for the other signatures we're, we, which we're not making. So it's just something that you need um, to make the script happy. And then this is the uh, actual script encoded um, 
fully, uh, which is needed for, for PWSH. Um, so I think I'm kind of running late, so I'm going to stop here and move to questions if you, if you have some. That's yeah. great. Now, go ahead. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, I was going to say, uh, great presentation, Alcos. I was uh, curious, um, how do you usually generate uh, these BIP32 derivation paths? Uh, I also saw that website, but uh, I tend to use like Tails with uh, Electrum, but I saw like a, a recent vulnerability in uh, Tails. Like, so I was just curious and exploring other methods. I know I've been suggested like HWI with uh, Trezor and stuff, but uh, happy to hear any uh, safe methods you think are good too. Yeah, so, well, obviously, um, the, the, that thing I've, I've done in a browser can work for like Testnet wallets, you shouldn't do that for mainnet wallets. Um, I don't know, I don't think there's like one specific uh, final answer. I think there are like trade offs in, in everything you do. So, probably an other wallet with SWI is the safest, like, especially if you're not very familiar with computers and everything, that, that's very easy to use. Uh, and I would say that that's probably the safest thing if you don't really know, uh, potentially don't really know what you're doing with, with keys and you might, I don't know lose them or, or expose them. Uh, I also like the idea of using like an old computer air gap. Uh, this is more like, I guess it depends on who you are trying to protect your keys from. So if you are more worried about like, um, I don't know, your the classic evil mail attack, or you, from maybe somebody coming into your house and, and stealing your keys, in that case, probably another wallet is safer because of the secure element, especially like Ledger that has like full secure element. Uh, that is probably safer, but on the other end, you have less um, like auditability there. So if you are more afraid by, I don't know, like somebody um, uh, placing backdoors in, uh, in other wallets on like a state level for, for something, like, or something like that, so if you want to protect your Bitcoin from uh, big attackers that are probably well-funded, well, in that case, it's probably better to use uh, like a general purpose computer because it's more... I mean, the idea is that if you really want to attack Bitcoiners, it's more likely that you're going to go attacking and placing backdoors into uh, Ledger, for instance, into Bitcoin companies. While instead, if you just take like a random computer used uh, paid in cash or something like that, it's probably more likely that there's a backdoor in there for specifically for Bitcoin. So I guess it's trade off. I, I would say these two methods, depending on uh, maybe even both of them. So with, with things like Magical, it's very easy to make multi sigs. So you could also use both of them uh, and just have kind of the best of both worlds in a way. Uh, but it depends on every use case. I would say there is no one answer for, for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. So Lekos, is this, um, I had earlier asked about simplicity. I actually meant to ask about Miniscript. So is this, oh, okay. yeah, I know. Sorry. That was, uh, I said the wrong name, but so this is using mini, is this using Minis, Miniscript? Yeah, uh, this uses uh, specifically the Rust version of Miniscript. There are like two implementation, one in C++ and, and then this other one. Um, so and yeah, basically it uses Miniscript for many things like compiling the policy, generating the descriptor, and also for a few internal um, things like, like the, uh, the part that actually, generate, that actually generates the final uh, witness, the, the final script seed is done by Miniscript. So I'm just like using the Miniscript library and providing that with the right things, the right parameters. That's very cool. Um, one of, I think Vivek mentioned that it's kind of like, so it seems like your value for the magical Bitcoin is that like you also provide visualizations to help people create the script as well, instead of like writing it, right? Yeah, so the idea is that uh, um, my main goal would be to just write developers tools. So I would love to see uh, like I, I don't want to focus myself on a lot of graphical tools. I would just like to make tools that are very easy to uh, integrate into graphical environments. So uh, the one I made, like specifically here in the browser with the um, with, with this compiler, that, that was just an example. Like really this it. took me like one afternoon to build. Yeah. Uh, now it's not loading anymore. So yeah, the goal is not really. Uh, I would say I mostly like writing stuff in a way that is. Uh, easy to integrate into user interfaces. For instance, even this thing I showed, uh, this should be fairly easy to integrate into user interface. So make like a graphical thing that says there are two items. Uh, uh, you can satisfy item number one. 
and that's enough to satisfy everything and, and you can make a nice UI around that. I'm probably not going to make it myself because I'm going to focus mostly on the low level tools, but I'm making them in a way that should be, uh, that, that should allow other people to build actual like full graphical wallets on, on top of that. Very cool. Okay. I have one last question. Um, what node are you using? What node am I using if I'm using your website to broadcast the transaction to testnet? Uh, so for this website specifically, you're using uh, Blockstream's uh, node. So Blockstream.info, the Blockstream.info Explorer. Ah, um, okay. The problem there is that from a browser, you can't really do much. So you're like sandboxing there. So the only thing you can do is HTTP requests. So you need some kind of HTTP backend uh, or for Bitcoin. Uh, so you, you could self-host Explorer. I guess you can install Explorer on your own node. It's probably very, very... Uh, uh, like it's pretty heavy, the, the like full blockchain index and everything, but you could do that. Uh, you have much more flexibility if you run that as a standalone like command. So here uh, in the docs, uh, um, this section right here explains how to install the command, like how to install Rust and then how to compile it and then uh, all the interface. If you if you install this on your own computer, so instead of running in the browser, you install it on your own computer. Uh, you also have the Electrum uh, support. So you can connect to any Electrum server. And then probably in the future, I'm also going to add the full node, like direct uh, RPC full node, maybe compact of filters. Uh, I really want this to be modular. So when you come, again, as a developer, you choose the, the things you need for your own product. So maybe some developer could use uh, the Explorer interface and, and then host their own version of Explorer. Maybe somebody else could use Electrum and, and stuff like that. This is a very cool project. Thank you. Very cool. Actually, it's just worth mentioning too that although you've, you've compiled this for the web, Rust is great for compiling to different platforms like mobile, so Android, iOS, all that stuff. Um, have you have you thought at all about you've got these these backends? Have you thought all about you said compact block filters? Like, which library for compact block filters would that be? Like one of the ones in the Rust Bitcoin project, like the um, normal or something? Um, I actually don't know, so I haven't looked into that yet. I, I don't think there's, uh, I, I don't think there's an implementation for that in, in Rust Bitcoin. So I would probably just make yes. my own in, the, in that case, but I, I'm not sure really. Um, okay. I can actually send you a link. There is one in that project called Normal. Oh, okay. It's probably not well supported, but I'll send you the link. I've been, I've been playing with it. That's why I asked because it's one that I've, I've looked into. Yeah. So. I just want to say one very quick thing. So you mentioned mobile apps. Uh, there's also a very, very uh, like. Uh, proto early prototype of an Android app. So this is just to show um, how easy it is to compile that to other platforms. So there, there's this, and they can zoom that in. Oh yeah, very uh, cool. So there are like J and I bindings for, for, yeah. for that. Uh, and there's also a very uh, simple, it doesn't support basically any of that. It only supports, I think, showing your balance or something like that. But should be, you have this Android app. Uh, this uses the Android uh, J and I bindings to uh, basically to make an Android app for that. And yeah, as you said, it's very easy to port on multiple platforms or it's just a matter of like make, putting some time there. Uh, and it's actually the binding time, things. right? All the interfacing. Yeah. That's the tricky part. Um, yeah, this actually reminds me a lot too, if, it's, if, you, if you're familiar with the Unchained Capital Caravan project where they basically have a little web interface for creating a multi-signature vault sort of thing. It seems like they wrote their project based on JavaScript. This makes a lot more sense for that kind of application, where it's in a, you know, slightly more, state, uh, slightly more trustable language. Yeah, I think so, and also it's like very easy to port if you then want to make like a native app, uh, a native phone app or a desktop app. You can just compile the code there, and, and you have you have everything. Probably a lot fewer dependencies too that you. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Does anybody else so, have any other questions? Actually, I'll just add one thing. Um, just uh, you know, for anybody that's interested in this stuff, check out his website and you know, definitely promote it on Twitter and wherever you're hanging out because it's great to get more developers looking at this this kind of stuff. This is really the future of Bitcoin as I see it. Cool, Lekos. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, this was uh, really interesting. It's cool to see more developer tools coming out for uh, Bitcoiners and Bitcoin developers.